My kids empowered me to get What's out. What's going on with this remote learning and in the midst of COVID? The work is for different elected officials, learning and understanding how to, to put the community first. Welcome to Keeping It Real with Shannon. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello there, Dr. Vanessa. Hello, Lottie. How are you? And did you have fun away celebrating your birthday? Oh, yeah. You know, I, this is the first time I gave a party at home. <laughs> I gave a party. It was it was, it was, was out of control. I'll talk about that offline, though. That's uh, different okay, kind of then. I'm glad you had a good time. So I'm just so excited about the show tonight because we have a, yes. uh, have a doctor, uh, Dr. Nadine Monterello, on to tell us about our heart. Because, you know, we don't take care of a heart like we're supposed to. And she's going to give us information about that. But before we get to her, uh, we want to pay tribute to our trailblazer tonight for um, Black History Month. And our trailblazer tonight is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Congressman Jeffries represents the diverse 8th Congressional District of New York and is serving his sixth term in the United States Congress. He's is the Democratic leader, having been elected to that position by his colleagues in November 2022. In that capacity, he is the highest ranking Democrat in the House of Representatives. Yes, he is also the former chair of the Democratic Caucus, whip of the Congressional Black Caucus, and previously co-chaired the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee, where he helped develop the For the People agenda. In Congress, uh, Congressman Jeffries is a tireless advocate for social and economic justice. He has worked hard to help residents recover from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic, reform of a criminal justice system, improve the economics for everyday Americans, and protect our health care from right-wing attacks. And so we thank you, Congressman Jeffries for all your tireless and hard work. And I want to thank you for coming to my house for the backyard party, all right? We had such a good time that evening, so thank you. And we hope <laughs> that you're still going to come on the show, like you said, all right? We're waiting for you to come. So we want to pay tribute to him tonight, <laughs> Congressman uh, High King Jeffries. Yes, from bed style. Now, all right. So now let's get to our special guest for tonight. Who's going to tell me about my Absolutely. heart? Absolutely. Our special guest tonight is Dr. Nating Montemarano. She's a cardiologist, cardiologist at Maimonides Medical Center. She received her medical degree at St. George's University School of Medicine. She specializes in cardiac disease in pregnancy, clinical cardiology, and women's health care. Her goal is to, put, is to promote optimal cardiovascular health by delivering quality patient care in a compassionate manner, adhering to the current best and guidelines and a, an ongoing education and clinical research. Let's welcome my special guest tonight, Dr. Nadine Montemorano. Yes, right. how are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing well. Well, thank you so much for coming. I, I, I've been so excited all week that you are coming. So this way you can tell me about my heart. Because, you know, our heart gets broken every now and then, you know, uh. besides all the other issues that we have with the heart. <laughs> but we're going to talk about the medical issues tonight, though. So we know a lot of people have heart diseases and problems with their heart and everything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is taking place now today what what do you see from you know talking to your patients and going on what what's causing all of this now i think a very big part of it is stress um i think oftentimes mm -hmm. we underscore just how important stress is and the negative impact it can have in our lives on our blood pressure on the way that we eat which will affect our cholesterol and can increase our cardiovascular risk on us developing pre-diabetes or diabetes obesity so stress management, I think, is an important role in everything, especially in cardiovascular health. Um, and another thing I want to point out that I'm noticing a lot is diet and lifestyle. Those two things are huge. Um, and it's not enough to just start focusing on it when we're 50, when we're 60, when we start noticing problems. The key is really prevention. So if we can practice 
good diet and good lifestyle changes. When we're in our 20s or even in our teens, then it substantially decreases our risk for developing cardiovascular disease when we're older. Mm. Mm. Now, when you say diet, right, we always say, oh, well, you shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't eat that. So by the time they name everything that you're not supposed to eat, there's nothing left to eat. <laughs> What's left to eat? <laughs> I, think they mean, I think they mean eat it in moderation. Not Don't <laughs> eat it at all. Food pyramid <laughs> is real deal. The food exactly. pyramid is our friend. We learned it when we were in kindergarten and in first grade. And the truth is, it still holds true to today. Absolutely. But you, know what? you hit on something. Tea. But you hit on but you know, something. Not, 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 not cutting uh, y'all off, but I'm just asking this question because they always say all of that kind of stuff, right? But I know people who eat healthy, eat healthy. They go to the gym, you know, they exercise, they healthy, but they sick. <laughs> they have all kinds of issues. You don't know what their underlying genetics is. You exactly. don't know what the underlying medical condition is just because they look healthy. So you look at someone, you're like, oh, they're lean. Oh, they look like they eat salads. They're probably healthy. It doesn't mean that they're healthy. So we don't know what their underlying Absolutely. medical conditions are. We don't know how much salt they put in their salad. We don't know what their blood pressure is. We don't know all of these things about them. So unless you actually dig into someone's medical history, the truth is the outside can be very deceptive. I have patients that have a very low BMI, meaning they're super skinny and their cholesterol is through the roof. So the truth is we, we, you don't know just from looking. You have to look at blood work. You have to get their history. And that's how you really know if someone is healthy. But you know what? You mentioned something earlier that a lot of things that are contributory factors for cardiovascular disease is stress. And I'm a big proponent of self-care. And just like we make our appointments for our cardiologists and our, and our primary doctors, we need to also schedule ourselves in on a schedule, give ourselves an appointment for self-care. And people may say, okay, so what's that going to do? Like a, what can 15 minutes do? What can a half hour do? What can a few minutes do? But collective with time, it can really reduce things so once you because your mind is your health i agree your with mind you is your health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's 100 percent right it's mind over matter remember that a lot of times when we eat too much a lot of it is stress induced again it goes back to the psychology of why we eat and the things that we eat and so on and so forth it's all connected and i do believe that exercise is good for mind body and soul so if we can exercise or even yoga, read a book, find a way to alleviate your stress or decrease your stress is so critical in managing so many aspects of our life, but especially cardiovascular disease and risk factors for developing mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe in putting mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. aside time for yourself. You know, I think we should do that every day, you know, because I don't talk to people between 1230 and uh, 2. Because uh, I'm watching my soap opera. But that's your form of self-care, right? And they help you relieve stress. And that may be good for you. Everybody mm -hmm. has some time to work. Yeah. Somebody takes a walk. Somebody walks their dog. Somebody gets But you know, you, 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 mm -hmm. and all yeah, that Absolutely. But watches her story. So you did. You mentioned something uh, regarding... I don't know. You keep going in and out. Maybe you need to go out and come back in again or something, but uh, whatever. Uh, while you're doing that, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Nadine, uh, the heart. We know the heart is this muscle, and that's the, I call it the major muscle in the in the body, because that, about that, we're not going any place. And we, we talk about diet, we talk about eating, we talk about taking care of ourselves. But then, when I look back at the kids, like those young kids, they have heart problems and diseases. Then I'm saying, well, how does that happen to them? Because they haven't been here long enough to, to eat bad like we eat and, you know, be stressed out like we are stressed know, out, you know. know. So what is it What is it with the heart that it, you know, um, become bad? I, I don't know how to put it. So, young. It, so why do people with, why are young people having heart yes. problems? Yes. So... The, the umbrella term of heart problems is really, really big, okay? So when you see a young person with a heart problem, it's probably not because of bad diet and lifestyle because, again, it hasn't had time to collectively accumulate 
to cause a problem. So oftentimes these young people either have congenital heart disease, which is something that they're born with, whereas in utero, um, things didn't develop right or for whatever oh, reason, okay. they're born with a heart problem. Or And also under that umbrella term, there are kids without congenital heart disease who, for whatever reason, mostly they're genetics, they're genetically predisposed to having these abnormalities of their heart muscle. And mm -hmm. so if you, if you have a genetic disease that is manifesting at such a young age, it's probably prominent and a pretty strong gene. Um, and it causes a problem for them. So when you see a young person with it, it's either they're born with it, it's congenital. Well, this is most of the time. It's congenital or it's a genetic problem that develops with time and not necessarily congenital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. sure if you ever talking about athletics, but um, sometimes we find it you know, um, that a lot of young kids that are athletes are coming out with these heart attacks and, and these right. um, particular cardiovascular right. Right. conditions. Yeah. It's very scary. So, you know, oftentimes it's not so much that they're athletes, that they're developing heart problems. Many times they have underlying cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. congenital mm -hmm. disease or genetic disease that is brought out. It manifests because right. of the stress of their exertion or the sport that they're playing. You know, just like Absolutely. the same concept of how like um, when women are pregnant, you think you're healthy, healthy, healthy. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, why is my blood pressure all of a sudden so high? Because pregnancy is a stress test. And so it will start to manifest all of these things that you normally wouldn't have are going to start to come out. It's almost similar with, with playing these, um, these, uh, heavy sports like football or something. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about, also about we were talking about the pre in women that's pregnant with the preeclampsia and all that like when they they pregnant because I remember when my daughter uh, had uh, my granddaughter and and everything was fine until we got to the hospital and then when we got to the hospital everything started to going wrong and the pressure shot up that's real it. real high like to two hundred and, and, and something yeah, or whatever. Right. This was like at the last minute, and this happened. So it, it's like you, when you were talking about women being pregnant, like what what triggers that? Is that the, the, the pain and stuff? I mean, I don't understand what triggers that. Before you ask, before you ask, we have to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. We'll come right back with Doctor Nadine. It's Shana. It's Shana. Get it, slip it, cuff it, check it. High blood pressure silently affects millions of Americans. Staying on top of your blood pressure is as simple as these four easy steps. Self-monitoring is power. Visit manageyourbp.org to learn more. We're back. If you're just joining us, we're with our special guest tonight, Dr. Nadine Montemarello. Before we went to break, we had asked the question. Um, uh, I cut you off to go to break. I'm sorry about that, but you can answer us. <laughs> you can answer us now. <laughs> so when we talk about what would make blood pressure shoot up when a woman gets to the hospital, we have to look at what can cause high blood pressure. Um, so a lot of times when a woman gets to the hospital and she's pregnant and about to deliver or she's not feeling well, she's incredibly scared and anxiety, fear, that will definitely make your blood pressure go up. So that's part of it, but not all of it. Um, and many times, depending on what the underlying pathology is, what's really causing an issue, women can get a catecholamine surge during pregnancy. So those are like stress hormones Stress hormones can start to go up. And then once that happens, the blood pressure just starts to shoot up. Other times, uh, especially if it's preeclampsia, um, which is high blood pressure with protein in the urine. And in some people, they have um, deranged liver enzymes. Um, when that happens, it's usually a disease of the placenta. 
and there's a problem with the inner lining of the blood vessels and it starts to become hyperreactive and it starts to get tight and the blood pressure just goes very high. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You know, um, I just wanted to add something. I know we still somewhat not out of COVID and people may, and there's some underlying conditions that are undetermined, um, but people just have a long-term COVID. But if you could just touch on something that's POTS, which is a post orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. A lot of people may be experiencing this and may not know what is related, what it, what it could be coming from. So POTS is a little bit challenging to diagnose. Um, it is a disease called, uh, it's under a term of autonomic dysfunction. Um, and what happens is a lot of times someone will be sitting down and they feel totally fine. And then as soon as they get up, all of a sudden, for no reason, they feel super dizzy. They feel like their heart is pounding for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, and they're incredibly uncomfortable. And, and many patients actually faint. Some don't faint. Um, but it seems to affect a lot of people's quality of life. It seems to affect women more than men. And a lot of times it affects younger women, women in their 20s and women in their 30s who seem to be completely healthy. Um, and, and this can be a real issue for them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not completely clear how COVID is associated with POTS, but we have seen it as part of a long COVID syndrome in a lot of our patients. So we're, we're still learning a lot about COVID, but for some reason in some pathway, it's causing autonomic dysfunction. Um, and the treatment for POTS is challenging. The diagnosis, a lot of times you'll go see a cardiologist and say, I fainted. I don't know why I fainted. I don't know why my heart is racing. I don't know. Every time I get up, I'm feeling incredibly dizzy. Your doctor will order a sonogram of your heart to make sure that the structure and function of your heart is normal. Um, and many times they'll order this test called a tilt table test. And in a tilt table test, they basically, it's something that's performed usually at a hospital in a procedure suite. And they lay you down on a table and they're constantly monitoring your blood pressure and your heart rate as the table elevates and goes flat. And that helps them to see uh, what's going on here. So many times if your blood pressure is not dropping, but they find that your heart rate is increasing and they don't know why, then they can many times diagnose you with POTS. Mm -hmm. And POTS seems to be also be associated in a lot of women, especially young women who have other diseases like autoimmune diseases. So we see it in women with rheumatoid arthritis. We see it in people with irritable bowel syndrome. We see it um, in, a, in a lot of patients with autoimmune disease. It's just very challenging to treat. There are medications, there are things that we can do, but it's not so easy and it's, it's a long road. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Nadine, would you say, okay. like I know when we have different, just like they say about diabetes, they say diabetes can be cured if you do the right thing. So when it comes to the heart, if you do treatment or do really like what you're supposed to do and everything, can you really heal the heart? Or once it's, once it's broken, it's just a matter of just treating it. I mean, what, I mean, like, what, is there anything that we can do, you know? So let's, let's go back a minute. So when we talk about a broken heart, the question is what broke it, right? So if our heart is a little bit unhappy because our blood pressure is too high, um, or let's say somebody had a heart attack, um, and sometimes after a heart attack, your heart can be a little sleepy and a little weak, then it's fixable, okay? We give a bunch of medications, we control blood pressure, we make sure your cholesterol is perfect, and hopefully with time, your heart will get stronger and get better. We call that a hibernating myocardium. Um, and other times when people, let's say, have heart attacks or have prolonged damage to their heart over time, we call it non-viable myocardium, meaning it's it's not sleeping. It's just that part of the muscle is dead. It's not working. Once you lose heart muscle like that, it will not come back. That's why we have patients with heart failure. Um, that is, you know, we treat them to control their symptoms and we do everything we can to make it stronger but it just doesn't get stronger. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. So now with the high blood pressure, uh, go ahead, Vanessa. You want to ask something, Vanessa? Okay. Well, I was just going to go to the button. Yes. I just want to just piggyback on high blood pressure that a lot of people don't know that 
um, high blood pressure is a silent killer and how that how it correlates with heart disease. If you could just elaborate a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so high yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. High blood pressure is terrible. People are walking the street with blood pressures of systolic, which is the top number of 200 over 120. Like, what? I feel great. Nothing's wrong with me. So Everything is fine. That's awful. That's the worst. That means that you're living at blood pressure like that. And your body and your brain have gotten so used to it that you don't even feel the effects of it anymore. That is a problem. Blood pressure will destroy your brain. It will destroy your heart. It will destroy your kidneys. It just destroys everything. And I tell my patients, think of it as like a plumbing system, right? Mm -hmm. If you have high pressure in a pipe, what's going to happen to that pipe? The inside right. of the pipe is going to erode. It's going to give you coronary mm -hmm. artery disease. It's going to pop. People die from aortic aneurysms. It's mm -hmm. awful. Mm -hmm. So many things can happen. People have strokes. It's very, very bad. So one of the best things you can do for yourself if you have high blood pressure, focus on your diet, focus on your lifestyle. But if you feel that that's not working, then you need to go see a doctor. And I know we don't like to take medications, but here's what it comes down to. It's right. benefit versus risk. If the benefits of taking the medication makes your blood pressure better and it saves you from having a stroke or a heart attack or ending up on dialysis, then guess what? Take your medicine. Because it definitely outweighs the potential risks of taking a medication. But you know, to add to that, a lot of people, a lot, I think, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people in denial with high blood pressure is because when they get chest pain, there's a lot of different systems in the thoracic area, so they don't really associate it with cardiac. Oh, this the thing I have gas. This yeah. thing's old oh, stress. There's muscle. There's nervous, and mm -hmm. they psychologically, you know, pivots outside the the, the fact that it could be really something cardiac related. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're totally right. I hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. Denial is a scary thing. It's a bad yes. thing. We do it to protect ourselves because we're afraid. We're scared. We're like, no, not me. I'm not sick. I'm fine. Everything is fine. No, everything is not fine. Absolutely. Go get you out. No, but, it, but, it's some, but sometimes it's hard to, sometimes I think it's kind of, well, I don't, I'm not no doctor, but I'm saying sometimes I think it's like hard to die. Not that we check, not that we should to, diagnose ourselves but sometimes it's kind of hard to say what are you having because if if i get chest pains right and, and like when i get chest pain it's real tight and i mean like oh my god am i having a heart attack or what and then all of a sudden i burp and then i'm fine so okay. I'll, well that's what i'm talking about having this gas, different system here. At that time. so i like, said okay well then well I, I was having gas but maybe i wasn't just having gas. I tell my patients, yes. when you have these types of symptoms, yes, I agree. It's very challenging sometimes to be able for the patient to decipher, what is this? Is this my stomach? It's here. I don't know what it is. Maybe I ate something. I tell them usually this, if it comes on with physical exertion and goes away with rest, it's mm -hmm. probably cardiac. If it comes on at night when you're laying down, not during the day, you can run a marathon and you feel awesome. But when you lay down at night after eating a big meal and you feel it and it's burning and it's rising in your throat, probably not your heart, probably heartburn. Mm -hmm. And I tell them also to just, if you're not sure, then go to the hospital. If after 15 mm -hmm. minutes, it's not going away, guess what? Mm -hmm. Go to the hospital. And I, and I actually tell people, try to not go to urgent care, try to go to the hospital because urgent care is awesome if that's the closest thing to you and you don't know what's going on, fine. Mm -hmm. But if you are close enough to go to an actual emergency room and it's accessible to you and the same equidistant from an urgent care, go to the hospital because otherwise you're adding an extra step. And if you're having a real problem, you don't want to add steps and you don't want to waste time. You want to go to the source of the place where they can fix the problem. Mm -hmm. So can your time. heart cause you to have fluid in the body? Yeah, if you have a weak heart or if you have a stiff heart or if you have a thick walled heart, that can all lead to heart failure. Your heart is the pump. If the mm -hmm. pump connected to the pipes, right? If the pump is not working, where is that fluid going to go? It's going to sit. And if mm -hmm. fluid sits, it starts to leak out of the blood vessels. And that's when you start to get water in your belly, water in your lungs, water in your legs. We're very much like a plumbing system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I I know that happened um, to my brother uh, before he passed. He blew up, Aww. like he swelled up real real big, you know, because um, he ended up having congest what they call it congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
unfortunately. But, but he didn't want to. He didn't want to go for them to drain the fluid out. He, oh. We only convinced him to go one time, and then after that, he didn't want to. He didn't want to go. So I don't know what it does to you when you go to have it drained. I thought he would feel better. Or so usually, what happens is usually they come to the hospital and we, we put in an IV line and we give them medications. We call them diuretics and it helps them to, to pee out all of that extra water. Mm -hmm. And then when that water comes out, they feel so much better. The legs right. get smaller, the belly right. gets smaller. It's like suffocating the heart, right? Yeah, it's just suffocating it's the heart. The heart. Full of, full of fluid. It's congested. That's why they call it congested heart failure. Yeah. But I, I think a good thing is what you were saying earlier about uh, the medicine. Not, not that we want to take medicine and we hate medicine and everything, but it is important that you should take your medicine. If yes. You, if they tell you to take the medicine. You should take the medicine until you can get yourself disciplined, you know, um, to get off the medicine, which I know is hard you know, for the discipline, but a lot of people don't want to take their medicine. It, a lot of people don't. And it's really unfortunate because that whole period of time where they could be taking it and decreasing their risk of having huge problem, they're fighting that they don't want to take it. And remember that even as a physician, we don't want to give medicine unless it's completely necessary. Right. We won't prescribe it just to give it because again, everything has possible side effects. Mm -hmm. So if we're prescribing it, it means we really feel it's going to benefit you. Well, Dr. Nadine, this part of the show, we're going to have to wrap up. We're going to come back for the after show. I mean, this has really been good. I'm so happy that you took the time, you know, okay. to come on and talk to us. Because like, you know, like I said, a lot of us, including myself, don't do what we're supposed to do. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on well, and telling you. us this much. And we're going to come back with our after show if you want to join us. So thank you for joining us at this time. You can join us. Stay on for our after show. Go to our Facebook and uh, our YouTube page and make sure you like, make sure you subscribe to YouTube. So as always, we'll see you next time. Today's show is sponsored by Abu's Bakery. If you have a sweet tooth, stop by Abu's Bakery for some delicious cakes and pies. Do you like beautiful pictures for your home or your office? Then stop by Abu's Gallery. They have a large selection of pictures from around the world. It's Shanna. It's Shanna. It's Shanna. It's Shanna. We're back for our after show. Our special guest today was Dr. Nadine Montemarano. So thank you again for Dr. Nadine for hanging around a little bit. But I wanted to get back because now, I mean, I knew it was important before, but now it's more scary than ever with the with this blood pressure, knowing that that's really the that's going to kill you, even though you have the heart disease and everything. But that's what's really making it sick. Now, I know you said sometimes it's genetics. Sometimes, like, we don't do our diet and stuff like that. But if if we follow what we're supposed to do and we're doing what we're supposed to do and it's still not regulated to come down like it should, you know, then what are some, What else can we do then? If we're, if we're taking that, even though we're taking the medicine and we don't do what we're supposed to do, it's not going to help. The medicine is not going to help anyway. But we still supposed to be taking it. But is there any other things that maybe we could do to help bring that pressure down uh, to get it to where it should, you know, in a normal range? When when we so okay, so when we talk about what can we do to bring it down, right? Let's say, you know, whenever somebody comes to my office and their blood pressure is not very high, let's say it's a little high or stage one hypertension, especially if they're on the younger side. I will try to find out what is your day to day? What do you eat? What do you do? Do you exercise? And go through their risk factors for hypertension. So then when we go through what are the things that we can do from diet and lifestyle, we ask ourselves, okay, what can we do from diet? 
So we all know about limiting salt. Fine. So let's say they, they tell me, well, I don't add salt to my food. Okay, great. But do you add hot sauce to your food? Have you looked at how much sodium is in the hot sauce and how much you sprinkle on? It's not a tablespoon. I'm sure it's a lot more. How much sodium is in that? How much sodium is in the dressing, your salad dressing that you use? How much sodium is in the prepackaged seasoning that you use? And the goal is to keep it less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium in a whole day. So that's one thing that can be done. Second thing is exercise. Exercise helps to dilate our blood vessels. And when we do that, we decrease our blood pressure naturally. Um, so what do I mean by exercise? I don't mean you have to go climb mountains, uh, start running marathons. That's not realistic. So what we usually tell our patients is 30 minutes of exercise five days a week is adequate. What kind of exercise am I talking about? I'm not talking about just sitting there lifting five pound weights. I'm right. talking about cardio aerobic exercise. In other words, I'm walking at a pace where I can talk to the person near me, but it's not super comfortable. I can't talk to you the way I'm talking to you now. I'm, All right. Yeah. Okay. I did this. Yeah, I, did, I did that. You know, you should be a little bit out of breath. You have to get your heart rate up. It's that kind of exercise. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Another thing to notice is alcohol. A lot of people don't realize alcohol raises blood pressure. So the American mm -hmm. Heart Association gives us a recommendation of how much alcohol we are allowed yep. to have in a day. So for women, they say, okay, if you really want to have one glass of wine a day, it's acceptable. And if men want to have two glasses of wine a day, it's acceptable. Is it recommended? No, because the reality is there's no benefit to drinking alcohol. There's no cardiovascular benefit in the real studies that we have to say, yes, you should drink. It's good for your heart. No, you should not drink. It's not good for your heart. But if you have a glass of wine per day, is it going to hurt you? Probably not. But if you mm -hmm. have high blood pressure, should you be having a glass of wine per day? No. Yeah. yeah. Probably not because it's going to be elevating your blood pressure. That's one of the things that can do it. Do you hear that, Dr. Vanessa? <laughs> well, listen. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> you hear her talking about the alcoholic heart? It's a it's it's a holiday heart. What I was I don't have those kind of issues. Funny, <laughs> but listen, the people the longevity, you know, those individuals are here, 100, 105, they method is a, a glass of wine a day. They got good genes. I mean, They're lucky. I know, I know. Oh, that's that. where it comes from because I saw this lady on TV. She was like 102 and they asked her that so question. Much, she she said lady. they have a glass of wine every day. Don't follow that one. Don't follow that rule. That's not me. That's a lucky lady. I know. No, but, no, know. But, honestly, sorry, but speaking of you, you were saying that it is not it is not okay for you to be drinking a glass of wine or liquor every day there is no oh, benefit period, period period there is no benefit if no, you have okay. high blood pressure you are you already have a problem so if you're going to add something to it that could potentially make it worse probably not a good idea and not every day you don't have to drink it every you day drink it every day you want to have a glass or two on saturday or sunday okay but you shouldn't be having a glass of wine with your dinner absolutely every day. You're hypertensive right mm -hmm. it's just, i know I know some individuals is out there that saying, okay, they have high blood pressure. They want to go to old school, right? They're going to old school. They use herbal method. They want right. to use over the counter medication. Can you really just elaborate how that contraindicates prescribed medication? So I think, yeah. And I'm very happy that you bring that up because I have a lot of patients telling me um, they go into a health food store, like a GNC, and they talk to the person who is working there and they tell them, I need something for my blood pressure. And they give them all sorts of things, um, different types of herbs. Um, I've seen garlic pills. I see all sorts of stuff. I'm not saying it's not medicine. It, it is medicine. Plants are medicine. The problem is it's not studied medicine. I don't know what dose you need to help you. I don't know if it's hurting you. I don't know really how it interacts with your other medications that you may take. A lot of these things cause bleeding. People come in with crazy bleeding episodes because they're mixing this with that. So really? yeah, be very, very careful with what you take because it is not benign because it's natural. Natural is medicine. Cocaine is natural, right? It's not safe. It's not good. So, so be very cautious with any vitamins that you, that you take. There are certain high-grade fish oils 
that can cause bleeding. They increase bleeding risk. So whenever you take something, I would have a discussion with your primary care doctor or have a discussion with your cardiologist and say, look, and I ask my patients when they come in, what medications are you taking? Okay, are you taking any herbs or supplements? Because people may forget that that's also medication. And I need to know what that is because it can interact with what you're taking. Oh, I didn't think, I didn't think we could. A lot of these things are. Well, I gotta take things. back all my stuff that I just bought. Shoot, I, I, no, no, seriously, because I go to the hospital store and, and I did the same thing that you said. I said, look, I need something to help bring down my blood pressure, right? So they gave me like the powder you drink, you drink. But but then what happened was I didn't drink it for like a couple of days because every time I would drink it, I'd be rolling on the floor. My stomach, oh. my stomach would be hurting so. That's a different yeah. kind of power that you got. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we'll take it anymore. <laughs> no, because it would be hurting my stomach. Sounds like the risks oh, out the benefits of that one. Yes. I'll be having my pressure come down. Not, uh, not having my, I mean, my stomach was crapping. Oh, my God. I was like, oh, my goodness. This can't, this can't be. Listen, Dr. Nadine, she'll be calling you soon. What a cutie pie. <laughs> Don't do it. I didn't, I didn't realize it was that. <laughs> Don't do it, Lottie. Don't yes. do it. The herbs. I'm not yes. because when they say herbs, I thought herbs was always, you know, good for you. But like she said, it's the doses, just like the medication. You come in with high blood pressure. You got to look at the class. You got to look at the dose. You got to look at, you know, what type of other comorbidities you have. It's not like it's no one size fit all. And yeah. everyone's going to be different. And sometimes you may have to go a couple of months to see how you're tolerable how you tolerate the medication. Yep. So the class may change, the doses may change, even the amount of pills may 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 um may change. I mean, look at look at hypertension. You know, sometimes um um let me see the um the uh what I oh, forget forget my offhand, but the ones that are um I can't think right now, but um are you talking the, about the, pills? the pills, the certain pills that have that's cough related. Oh, that's the AC inhibitors. The AC, right. Right, it and cough. then, right, it causes cough, but it's a good medication. But people can't tolerate the cough. You got no, people that need diuretics. Yeah, right. They got people that take diuretics, the water pills, but they don't want to go in the bathroom every two minutes, every case. So there's some good medications, but oh. some people, you know, it all depends. I think what's important is have the conversation with your doctor and yes. say, look, I need. Sometimes people don't take their medicine, but the physician also needs to ask why. Because sometimes, many times my patients say to me, and you, you hit the nail on the head. They're like, oh, I don't take that pill. I'm like, why? You don't feel good with it? Why don't you want to take it? And they would say, well, because I don't want to run to the bathroom every 15 minutes, oh, which okay. is very reasonable. Okay, no one wants to run to the bathroom every 15 minutes, but then the doctor can prescribe a different one that doesn't make you have to run to the bathroom all the time. So you got to have an open discussion with your doctor. You have to be comfortable with them. Just tell them exactly what you're taking. Be very honest, because if you're not honest, then we can't help you. Well, you know, Dr. Nadine, I think, too, because I have that mentality, too. Like, okay, I take the pill because I have the symptom, but really I don't want to take the pill. Because my thing is, we say we can't take the other stuff because you, you shouldn't be mixing it, which is true. But then you don't want to keep taking those pills year after year after year because I don't care what they say. I know those pills start messing with your other organs. It yeah, the soda's to. uncontrolled blood pressure will mess with all of your organs. So again, it's risk benefit. The pills, do they have side effects? Yes, I would be lying if I told you no. But you know what? Everything has a potential side effect. I can walk across the street and get hit by a bus. So me crossing the street has a potential side effect. It's, mm -hmm. it's life. Everything is risk benefit. The reality is this. If you need the medication, if the doctor says, We've tried this, we've tried this, we've tried this, and it's not working, and and your blood pressure is still uncontrolled, you cannot play games with that because you do not want heart failure. You don't want to be walking around with an IV infusion pump to make your heart work. You don't want that stuff. So if the worst thing in the world is to take these three medicines every day, forever, but if those three medicines keep you alive and keep you healthy, then they're worth it. And if you're worried, you, you just continue to follow with your doctor. They will do your blood work regularly. Doctors mm -hmm. usually would do the blood work, depending on the medication, twice a year, every six months. Yeah, I make, sure, I make sure that happens. The blood yeah, make work. sure that happens yeah. and say, look, check my blood work. Check yeah. this. I want to make sure that that medicine isn't hurting my kidneys or it's not hurting my yeah. electrolyte levels. 
then yeah, I mean, yeah. we start medications, but you should be closely monitored. So right. if something yeah. is happening where it's you see some adverse effect, it can quickly be stopped yeah. and not cause long term effects. Yeah. Right. Well, you and know, Dr. Blood Mike, work is definitely important. Yeah. I make sure that because like kidney Very. trouble mm -hmm. is in my family because I okay. had, you know, two aunts and relatives that die, you know, of kidney failure. So I try to make sure I, you know, keep an eye on that just in case because of, of the high blood pressure and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I try, you know, I know it's hard. It is hard because it, and, you know, like I tell my daughter, like, you know, do what they tell you to do, you know, and, and take your medicine if you have to take medicine. Not that we want to take it, but it's better for you to take it and, and for something to really happen and you're not taking it or whatever. But could you please also just touch on what, what did they mean when they say you have an enlarged heart? Yeah, so an enlarged heart can mean a couple of things. Um, mm -hmm. It just means the heart is bigger. Okay, fine. But now why is it bigger? And what do we mean by bigger? So sometimes the heart muscle becomes thick. That could be an enlarged heart. That's called left ventricular hypertrophy. The muscle gets thick. We mm -hmm. see that for different conditions, but one of them is high blood pressure. Other people have a genetic predisposition or something, some other disease processes going on it doesn't make the wall thick, but makes the actual outside of the heart big and stretch out and the wall gets thin. And that's a dilated cardiomyopathy. So enlarged heart is a very vague term. If somebody tells you that, you have to say, what do you mean by enlarged heart? Because you need specifics to go with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, I, oh, before we close, I just want to, I know, you know, cardiovascular diseases also works hand in hand with stroke. If you could just give that audience some signs of stroke, uh, stroke um, awareness. Oh, for sure. So stroke is similar to a heart attack. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we always say that um, we say stroke, people forget. I like to call stroke a brain attack just like a heart attack is a heart attack. So time is very important. So if you see someone that is behaving very abnormally, um, you see that their speech is impaired, um, you see that they can't walk or one side of their body is all of a sudden weak, these acute changes, that's really important. And if ever you're not sure, you call 911 right away. Someone's talking to you and all of a sudden their speech sounds like it's all mixed or all confused or part of their face droops or Anything like that, call nine one one. I mean, because that is is that that can come out of, of nowhere. I I remember one time when my mother was alive, right? We were sitting at the table having our Sunday dinner and everything, and we were just talking, 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 and all of a sudden, my mother just went over just like that, and I I started screaming. You know, I was screaming at her, "What's wrong? Wake up! Wake up!" And then I started screaming, and I had my daughter to run and call nine one one. And I'm screaming like some crazy woman on the phone, who holding the phone with 911. They got here like boom, boom, boom. They were here. And when the lady was coming up the step, all of a sudden my mother just sits up, sat up in the chair. Because I started hitting on her, right? And she just sat up in the chair and asked me, what was I slapping on her like that for? Oh my God. And I'm looking at her like, because you weren't saying anything. I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. Of course. <laughs> and I told her what happened and everything. And she says, well, yeah, she, she could have had, I think she called it um, a mini stroke yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. I think she might have had yeah. a mini stroke or something like that. She said mm -hmm. that they go out for a couple of minutes and then, and then they come back. Scary. It's the same yeah. underlying disease process though. They're just very lucky mm -hmm. that there's no residual defects on the MRI of the brain. Mm. It's all about mm. time. 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 Timing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, well, but, but I'm just saying it happened. It just happened so quick and everything that you just didn't know what had happened or whatever, you know. And because with with the stroke, you know, in the heart, like you say, with with this, having a stroke, and sometimes they say like your mouth starts to twist. Yeah, you see like asymmetry all of a sudden of the face. This starts to droop mm -hmm. or yeah. the mouth starts to droop or mm -hmm. a lot of times a lot of my patients, the way that they present is all of a sudden I couldn't lift my arm. My arm was weak. I just, I don't know what happened. I didn't feel this side of my right. body. A lot of times right. stroke symptoms are one side, not like both of my legs went numb. That's weird. Usually mm -hmm. it's unilateral. So my right or my left, 
and you lose function or you can't speak or something along those lines, be very vigilant about that. So when that happens, before we go, when that happens, right, say you feel a little twist in your mouth or like you say with your arm, but then it just goes away. So does it go back to normal the way it is or could something still be there? You really need to go get it checked. You need to go get it checked out. Something mm -hmm. could be there. There could be a yeah, clock somewhere that's there. stuttering where blood is passing and then it closes off again. You don't know. Not something you want to mess with because brain that's is time. Thing. And mm -hmm. once your brain goes, it's not coming back. Yeah. So whenever you don't know, you call 911 and you go and you get it checked out. And worst case scenario, if you have a problem, they will do what they need to do to help you. Best case scenario, they say, man, nah, you're fine. They send you home. Good. Then you go home with clarity of mind and you know that you're okay. Yeah. Best to be safe and sorry. Yeah. Dr. Nadine, thank you so, so you. much. And I want to thank Dr. Conry. Uh, I'm a favorite person. We love Dr. Dr. Conry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Introducing us and I mean, you have been so great and informative tonight. Thank you so much for taking Aww. the time to come. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for us in the audience and stuff like Absolutely. that. Because, like I said, I mean, I know we got to get more discipline, including myself, and we need to really pay more attention, you know, to our health issues and and take it more seriously. Um, I mean, I would like to stay here a couple of more years, you know, uh, or whatever. A lot more years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You are young. You are Even though she's young. Come on, nurse. I still want her here for years. <laughs> you got to get thinking that you're 105. You got a long way to go, ladies. Yes. You gotta okay. You're I'm going to gonna promise you and, you and Dr. Nadine that I'm going to change my bad habits. I'm going to do, do better. I'm going to do better. We're holding you better. to it. You're on camera. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now you have to be accountable, Lottie. Thank yes. you, thank you. So <laughs> I hope you'll come back again so we can so. Yes. this because there's so much more to talk about that we can't get it all mm -hmm. in in one, one show. So hopefully you'll come back later on, you know, when you have time again and, and enjoy yes. us again. Oh, I, I really appreciate that. that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, you, thank you so much again. And thank everyone for uh, watching tonight. I hope you got something out of uh, the show. It's very informative. And as you need further information, you have her information up, or you can call us uh, the show if you need a cardiologist. Um, at, at, you at Maimonides, uh, she's at Maimonides Hospital and stuff like that. So thanks again, and, and happy birthday to you again, Dr. Vanessa. I hope you had fun and everything, you know. Yes. So as always, we'll see you next time. All right.